How many of you are wondering what is the best position for me to labor in or have my baby in? You're not going to find an answer because it depends. It depends on you. The research isn't going to give you an answer and every mom you talk to is going to say something different. That's why I am a huge fan of practicing every position so that you're ready for anything. I've got a really exciting um, collection of discussions to follow here with seven different doulas. And the goal is that they all cover a variety of positions that you may have heard about, you may have learned in your prenatal classes, and they all serve as a bit of a demonstration or an explanation with the goal that you go and practice them all. As a pelvic health physical therapist, my role is to help you understand your body, understand your pelvic floor, understand how your breath relates to your pelvic floor and what things you can do to feel like you have some sense of control of your body. And then I want you to take that concept and the feeling of how it feels to be nice, relaxed, soft and open and be able to apply that in a variety of different positions. So sit back and watch as I talk with several different wonderful doulas out there that are here to help you feel more and more prepared for your birth. Okay, Samantha. Now it's Samantha's turn from Carolina Doula Collective. Tell me a position that you commonly see or one of your favorites. Yeah, so one of my favorites is actually side lying with the peanut ball. And I really like this one because I feel like a lot of times, um, a lot of emphasis is put on upright positions and positions that you can do while you're moving around. Um, and those are great and super effective, but we're not always up and moving around. You know, if clients are choosing to utilize an epidural or if they're just really tired and they, their legs need a break, you know, and they just want to rest, you know, you can still be in the bed and keeping your pelvis open and, you know, utilizing a lot of the same benefits that we might see from, you know, more upright positions as well. Okay. And the peanut ball is really helpful with that. We show a picture of one, Samantha? Yeah. So I have this picture here, which is actually from the Lamaze website. So when I'm talking about a peanut ball, it is basically created like an exercise ball or what sometimes, you know, people will call a birth ball, but it's in the shape of a peanut basically so it's got this narrow area here and then larger round um, areas on the ends and they come in different sizes um, just like regular exercise balls and you know from this picture here in the top left you can kind of see you can use it like straight like this um, which just kind of keeps the pelvis open in a way similar to if you were just standing um, and that can be really helpful at just making sure that there's still space in your pelvis for the baby to keep moving down um, and for labor to progress even when you are resting um, or if you have an epidural. Um, and then you can also use it to support your leg in different positions um, like this one, which we usually call exaggerated lateral sims. Um, that can be good for if you need to kind of roll over, if there's fetal positioning, like if we're trying to get a baby to move or rotate a little bit so that they have a better angle for coming down in the pelvis. Um, and then you can even turn it and just have your legs in this narrow part and that can also open um, the inlet of the pelvis kind of depending on where the baby is. Um, if the baby's still pretty high and we're trying to get the baby to engage down into the pelvis, then that position can be helpful as well. Yeah, and that's something we talked about in one of the previous positions, how the, kind of the position of your pelvis or the position of your legs, like kind of your ankles in relationship to one another, can influence, like the, the you know, like you said, kind of like the outlet, but also the inlet. So the, the hip position, because the hips go in here, like you said, can kind of influence this, this model doesn't move, but it'll influence kind of like the, not only the pelvic floor, but the bony pelvis itself. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I had that as soon as you started talking about, it, I'm like, I know some of the questions people will have. Will hospitals all, like, I know that every care provider is different. Like, usually as a doula, do you provide that equipment or will the hospital stock it? I know everyone is a difference, but like when, are the people that you support, what does that usually look like? 
Yeah. So I think that the biggest thing is to ask if you have a doula, you know, you can ask the doula about the hospital that you're going to. Otherwise, you know, if you have a hospital tour, which I know people aren't necessarily doing in-person tours right now. Um, but if you're doing a virtual tour, sorry, I'm plugging my phone in there. Um, then you can ask and they can tell you what equipment that they have on the labor and delivery floor of your hospital. In my area, most of the hospitals do have both regular birthing balls and peanut balls. Um, so I don't bring them with me because they are already there. Um, but I know, you know, in different areas, doulas will bring it with them. Um, and, you know, sometimes clients will bring it with them as well, usually like deflated with a little pump, um, like an electric pump that you can plug in and inflate it pretty quickly. Awesome. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of hospitals are moving in the direction of having these things. Um, awesome. so, yeah. and so would you say that generally, you know, it might be a suggestion that you bring up, you know, they try it. If it feels good, great. If not, you kind of move to the next option, right? I mean, it's trial and error. Yeah, Most of the time it's trial and error. If, you know, if you, have an epidural or there's a reason that you're having to stay in bed. Sometimes that might be because of like fetal heart tones or something else that's going on. Then sometimes we will more strongly encourage using it just because we, you know, might know that like where you are in labor, like you might be more subject to a stall and we want to avoid that, but we're still not, we're never going to make anybody do anything that is going to feel uncomfortable. Um, and make it feel like a not a not positive experience awesome i love it yeah thank you so much and yeah. uh, i appreciate your time of course hey erin i'm so happy that you're here to share your favorite i don't know kind of labor or birth position thanks for having me um my favorite position is having uh the woman sit on the toilet and birth there it. I love it. I, I said to her when she first popped up on the screen, I'm like, why aren't you on the toilet, right? You have to do this on the toilet. <laughs> I almost, I almost went, but my back uh, is probably not clean enough. I love it. And I want to just say really quickly as a way to kind of segue into you, this is something I teach all my clients during pregnancy. I teach them like what it feels like to like open and close the hole that the baby comes out. And it's the same like peeing poop holes, the same as the vagina hole. And so I love that, like the things they're learning, they can translate to being, you know, in the, in the situation. So talk about it more. Well, I remember even when I was pregnant, I remember doing a prenatal class and um, one of like the, the advice I was given is while we're sitting on the toilet to do a number two is to really practice relaxing um, and just breathing our poop down really. Cause it's like a lot of the same um totally. mental muscle so just yeah so that's what i would do i would sit on the toilet and just <laughs> meditate and breathe um, awesome so, so do you find that like um you know i guess whether someone's at home or in the in the hospital like do you just is that something that you kind of like guide them to like do you say like hey do you want to try this or do you wait till they have some sort of urge or what does that look like no well i mean Oftentimes I have moms, um, you know, empty their bladder on the toilet because obviously we know, uh, you know, a, 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 an empty bladder is going to help baby come down. So, you know, sometimes it is, you know, we're, we're at a standstill or we need to change positions or they just, it's been a while since they've gone to the bathroom and I'll just say, let's go sit on the toilet for a little while um, just for a change or to, you know go pee. Um, so that. that's kind of how it just starts. But we, you know, as, as a doula, I like to have my, my clients changing positions often so that they're not stagnant. And um, uh, so that just ends up being a place that I really love sending them to. Well, absolutely. Cause it's kind of like, you know, so many times a day you sit down and you relax those muscles to mm -hmm. pee and poop. So it's kind of like, I'm sure it's kind of like, you're hoping that it kind of like kicks in some of that automatic relax yeah. well I mean and sometimes too you know you can really just relax not only like not only are you sitting on the toilet and um you know there's that kind of memory of relaxation but I mean you can turn off the lights you can you know just like use it as a place to get some rest and it's really going to allow your pelvic floor to soften and relax which is so important so you know kind of just sitting there 
you can lean into your partner, you know, just hug and connect and, or your doula and turn off the lights, put on some music and just like really kind of go deep into it. Um, or turn around and face the wall and kind of lean over the, the, the top, the tank, the, t the toilet. So awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much, Erin. Yeah, you're welcome. Stephanie, what position are we going to talk about? We are going to talk about the lithotomy position. So otherwise, or more commonly known as being on your back with your feet up in the air. Awesome. So I know, I mean, I know what people are thinking. A lot of people are like, no, 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 I'm not doing that one. I've seen that that one's bad. So why, like, why are we going to talk about it then? Well, I think it's, it's worth knowing about before you go into your birth. Um, because a lot of women do end up in that position, you know, whether or not they planned on being there, circumstance sometimes does um, mean that they end up in that position. Either they get tired or um, with ep epidural, maybe they've lost, you know, use of their legs. Um, so it's really important that if you do end up in that position, you know, you have the tools to make it, you know, the most efficient that it can be for you. Awesome. I agree. Okay. I'm going to show us, show us. Show you. Okay. <laughs> Let me set up here. Tell me when, if you can't see anything. So, okay. And I'm kind of moving things. I think I'm here. Can you see awesome. me like this? Yes, I can. Okay. So this is probably traditional lithotomy, you know, what we think of when we see it. So flat on your back, your head would be down, knees up in the air. Um, what we probably see more of it now if we're in the hospital is in like a semi-reclined position. So yes. feet up again, back kind of reclined. Um, so how can we make this work a little bit better for us? Yeah, because um, I think that like you said, what you touched on, and I definitely remember this position is like, I was, my husband was told to like bring back my knees and I would say my knees were kind of like wide. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you show that? Like my yeah. knees were kind of wide. Okay, so this, and, yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So. The problem with the knees wide is that it closes the pelvic outlet. Hmm. Okay. So we want to, if we're going to be in this position, knees in, ankles out. Mm -hmm. That actually creates more room in the pelvis, pelvic outlet. I love it. And, and I think that's a good one for like, I often tell people when they say, what do you mean it closes the pelvic outlet? Like try it, like get into that position. Like Steph just showed and try both ways because you'll know it's because of how like your knees go back into your into your femurs or like your hip bones and how those go into the pelvis so when you move those you'll kind of change the pelvic floor and and the bony structures so try it and you'll notice kind of how your pelvic floor kind of like tightens or the whole mm -hmm. outlet tightens mm -hmm. awesome thank you so much Steph no problem hey Robin tell us about the ball so this is just a regular exercise yoga ball. It can be pumped up um, to be comfortable. So you got your feet flat on the ground. And then when you're in labor, you can be doing sways, sort of like rocking and um, circle motions with it. It also is a great position um, where you can lean over and someone can do the counter pressure on your back or your hip squeeze. You can lean over onto a bed or onto some pillows. Um, so I, I love this position for continuing to get some motion but also it gives the pelvic floor a lot of just nice space and um, room to, there's not as much pressure on that area to be moving around on a ball. Totally. I think so like ball. It, it ties in nicely because like, I like to give people different visuals and cues, like you said, to help open and relax. And I think that that's another way, like whether it be visuals or cues, but that's it, like rhythm and movement is another really good way. Like, you know, when you're in pain and you just kind of like want to rock side to side or how much we like rocking chairs, you just look at that and think, this is what makes like me think of relaxation, just the rhythmical movement, but also just change. And I'm, and I'm guessing a lot of times women, you know, um, you know, feel like they, they stall or they feel like they're not progressing. And sometimes you just need to like change it up, right? Like just change yeah. up whatever you're doing. And I, I'm, I'm guessing movement is a really good way to do that. Movement is key. You want to keep moving to give, you want to give the baby lots of room to, to find the right passage through. And so by giving that space, by moving the hips and rocking, um, for one, it's creating that rhythm that you're talking about. So you can breathe as you move, um, mm -hmm. as well as giving the body all these different opportunities to move so that you give the, the baby the best, best possible chance of coming down in a good position. I love it. Thank you so much, Robin. 
Okay, Kathleen is already in her favorite position. Before I hit record, we were laughing about how um, our life is not perfect either. And she was just saying, I've just cleaned up from a baby class and my office is a mess. And I was like, Kathleen, what's that bouncing noise in the background? She's like, oh gosh, that's the bass of someone playing downstairs. So anyways, we were just kind of having a chuckle about that. Kathleen um, is going to talk to us about one of her favorite positions, hands and knees. Hands and knees. It's perfect. I always uh, encourage hands and knees and then when people start to get tired, I always say this position's good. Come right down. Let your head go. Thumb in the air. And I like this variation on the hands and knees as well where you leaning in and opening. And whatever you do on one side, you're doing on the other side. This is good for more of an active labor piece. Kathleen, will you demonstrate, like when you're down on hands and knees, will you show kind of what it looks like for the knees to be angled in versus out? Yeah. Because um, I love this position and be able to show people, you might have to back up just a little bit. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, that way. And just show like, yes, can you see, I can't really see how your knees are angled in versus out there and then angle them the other way. <laughs> Can you see my knees at all? No, nope, because your tights are the same color as the, <laughs> there, awesome. Yes, so kind of like, yeah, ankles out, knees together yeah. versus ankles together, knees apart. And I would love for everybody to practice the difference between those because you'll notice like how your whole pelvis, the position of your whole pelvis changes and how your pelvic floor can open differently. Um, practice them because you'll notice that one allows your pelvic floor to open more, whereas the other one wants to keep the pelvic floor a little bit more closed. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Hey Angie, I'm Hi. excited for you to tell us your favorite labor or birth position. Yes, labor and birth and pregnancy. <laughs> um, something that I really love to prescribe to my clients is slow dancing. Um, <laughs> there's so many great things about slow dancing. It's, it's one of those tools that you know, you get, you're told in pregnancy to like, hey, you know, you need to prepare for labor. You need to really get into a flow and practice your breathing. But it's nice to have something where you're actually, it makes it easy to practice it. Mm -hmm. And slow dancing covers all of that because it's all about focus and rhythm and getting into a flowy breath where you can slow down your breath. Um, and then really changing your mindset like on demand basically to kind of like really positive associations with labor and pregnancy and intimacy with your partner if you have a partner or just romance to your baby just being so in love with becoming a mother um, because music is so powerful it just gets you into a mood immediately I mean you know if you're going out like girls night or something you're like okay we're gonna get ready together like let's put some music on or you know if you look outside and it's suddenly snowy and you want to like oh get, get in the mood of coziness you put on some nice jazz or some christmas music or whatever it is whatever time of year it's because music just gets you into the mood really quick it's a quick little cheat right mm -hmm. and music and dancing and dancing with your partner if you have a partner is just a really great catch-all way to just get you practicing slow breathing and thinking about baby while you're just thinking about it so romantically and you got oxytocin flowing through your body um and taking a break like taking intentional break from just what you're doing to just hey i'm gonna have some me time or have some us time um and then of course the movement part helps with you know you've got your the whole body part of just you're slowing your breathing it helps your hips and you're moving and just relaxing so any any way that you can find that really helps you like have positive associations and breath practice with just everything throughout pregnancy it makes it so much easier in labor so you can just put on your favorite playlist in labor and just oh yeah i've been here before i'm so relaxed exactly oh. i love it yeah angie on uh, uh, on your way out show us your moves my sweet, my, you want my, I want your slow dancing moves. Slow dance moves. Yeah. All right. This is going to be very like Liesl in 
in Sound of Music. Yeah. You gotta get, you gotta really just, so I don't have a partner, but pretend Love. I do, okay? Yeah. I'm just gonna, you have a bump. So yeah. You have a bump here. Yeah. And you can't quite reach them, which yeah. is super cute. And so you just kind of hug like this. Perfect. And I mean, if you want, you could put on some Shakira. Yeah. Practice some Shakira. <laughs> Beyonce. Mary J. Bly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Angie. Thanks so much, Mel. Bye. All right. Hee hee. Tell us about water birth. Hello. Well, I should say water for labor and birth. Yeah, exactly. So um, I think that's a great place to start is that distinction that you can actually use um, water in labor. This is called hydrotherapy. This is where you're actually going to be, your body's going to be submerged in the water as a means of pain relief, right? Not only that heat is going to help, but being in that water, being able to have that buoyancy that being in water provides us also will be able to help. And it also, um, it, it, the, your body's going to absorb the water. So it makes you a little bit more limber and it keeps you hydrated. So hydrotherapy in labor, really, really great. Um, water birth is where when you are ready to push your baby out, you actually remain in the water. So depending on where you're kind of watching from in the U.S., water births are very hard to find in the hospital system. For the most part, we see them done um, at home births under midwifery care. Every now and then, um, and we actually have a place here, I'm located in Boston, but we actually have a place here in Massachusetts that does allow, allow um, water birth, right? For you to actually remain in the water. But for the most part, if you're given birth in the hospital, even some birth centers, they are going to require you to get out of um, the water because it is, you know, illegal or outlawed or just against hospital policy. So do understand that distinction. Now, they kind of go hand in hand. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is going to be hydrotherapy as far as pain relief because it's got some amazing benefits such as lower um, uses of pain relief. So not as many epidural uh, placements, not as many administrations of Nubane or Stadol. Those are narcotics that can be given as pain relief during labor. Um, you're going to see higher rates of vaginal deliveries and less C-sections. You're going to see shorter second, uh, actually first, second, and third stage of labor. So first and second are early labor, active labor, and pushing your baby out. And then third stage of labor is actually the delivery of your placenta. All three of those stages are shorter using hydrotherapy and remaining in the water. So we can conclude that you'll have a shorter labor if you use water as pain relief, right? Now, a lot of people have questions about the safety of actually remaining in the water um, during you know, actually your baby exiting, your baby actually being born. Couple things on this. Your baby comes from a sack of water. So they are designed to be submerged under water until their face hits the air initially. We can see this biology kind of play out when babies are born and it takes their brain a minute to register. Hey, I'm on the outside. Hey, I gotta take a breath myself oh, I got to breathe. And we see that little lag in babies not taking their first breaths for a couple seconds, right? It's pretty typical. Their bodies have to realize, oh, I'm not in water anymore. Oh, I got to do this myself. And what's actually happening is as your baby exits and your placenta realizes your baby is on the outside, the umbilical cord is going to start flushing that blood into your baby that it was once circulating. And it's going to remind your baby to take their first breath. So if you were under the water, your baby's going to come from water and come right into water. And they're never going to take their first breath because their face never hit that air. Okay. You can see in videos, and I've been to home births, water births before, where you can leave your baby under the water for what some people would call a substantial amount of time, um, a few minutes, but for the most part, it's typically less than one minute, but you don't have to bring them immediately out. They can just hang out. It allows their body and their sensory system a little bit of a calming time, a grounding time to make that transition from that really tight squeeze through the birth canal on to land or earth side, right? Um, and so being in that warm kind of buoyant water of the birthing tub is going to provide them that. So very cool. Um, we actually have quite a number of studies looking at water birth and the safety in this, right? And 
There are no increases in things like NICU um, stays or lower APGAR scores, babies who are born um, on land is what we call it, or in a water birth, they have the same APGAR scores. Um, I have them written down because I want to make sure I hit them all. It's lower, um, there's no increased risk of respiratory distress or the need for infant resuscitation or infections or hypothermia. So that last one is important too. People sometimes will think, well, gosh, if your baby comes out in water and, you know, they, they we then take them out of the water, isn't it like when we give them a bath and they, they get cold? No, again, they're coming from water. So we want to make sure that we kind of keep that in mind that water is not dangerous for your baby. Once they're out, we do want to keep them out because then they'll be breathing air. But if you, if you kind of have them in the water, then then all is well. It's important to think about satisfaction too. So we see satisfaction in water birds skyrocket. So a 2010 study actually showed that over 72% of people who had water birds would do it again, while less than 9% of people who had land births would choose that method again. So you know, we have to we have to think about patient satisfaction and when it comes to the way that you remember your birth that's everything. This birth story is kind of one and done. You get one chance to have this birth story. And so we want to make it right. We want to make sure it's something that you're proud to remember, that you are proud to share, that you're empowered by when you think back on your, um, your birth story. So yeah, I think that's kind of the rundown on water birth and hydrotherapy using water in labor as a method of pain relief. I love it. And I absolutely love at the end that you talk about um, satisfaction, because honestly, I think this is a good way to kind of like tie up this whole series is that at the end of the day, I think that's one thing that um, matters the most. So absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The way that you remember your birth. Um, it's important. It is super important. It is a story that will define who you are as a person. Your birth impacts everything thereafter. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.